What's your full name? <laughs> Herschel Woody Williams. My middle name is really Woodrow, but uh, I've been known as Woody since I was a teenager, so. Yeah. Yeah. Officially, it's Herschel Woodrow Williams. And what's your birth date? October 2, 1923. Okay. And where'd you grow up? I grew up in a little farm community, farm and coal mine community, of a quiet dell, West Virginia. It's up in the northern part of the state near Fairmont, West Virginia. Okay. Quiet dell. Yes. That sounds... Sounds very nice. <laughs> well, it was it was a good community, mostly uh, mostly farming. We had a few individuals that would travel f from Quiet Dell to a, another location for coal mines, but uh, yeah. we were dairy farm people. Uh, my father started a dairy farm when I was just I don't know three four years old, and <clears throat> so we grew up on a dairy farm. How many in your family? There were eleven born to the family. Uh, none of us ever had a doctor, and, uh, but only five of us survived to adulthood. Four boys and one girl. Okay. Where did you fall in there in the fourth age group? I was the very last. Okay. I was number 11. Uh, I only weighed three pounds. <clears throat> they really? really didn't think I was going to make it. Were you premature? or? No, I was on time, wow. apparently, but uh, I, for whatever reason, <laughs> three-pounder, and they weren't sure I was going to make it. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> they tell me, naturally I don't remember, but they tell me they didn't have anything to put me in in the way of a bed, so they used one of my dad's shoe boxes as my, as my crib, <laughs> if you would. <clears throat> And since we were about seven and a half miles out of Fairmont, doctors didn't, in those days, most of them didn't even have an automobile, and they didn't travel house to house. And, but uh, somehow my folks convinced uh, the doctor, Herschel Yost, to come and visit us at, when I was about three days old to check me out. Uh, and he apparently said, well, if you keep doing what you're doing, he'll make it. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> well, that's, that's wonderful. So you, how long did you, did you live there until? until yeah, we were, still, we were still on the farm. <clears throat> During the Depression years, uh, when... Uh, once my, my dad got the farm established, and we were milking cows at, uh, every day, of course, uh, and we were delivering milk and and produce, chickens, eggs, butter, whatever, to families in town seven and a half miles away. Uh, my dad had an old Model T Ford that we started in, Model T Ford pickup, mm -hmm. and... <clears throat> And then when the Model A came out, uh, he was able to get a Model A, uh, which was a little better automobile, had a little more power, you could haul a little more stuff on it. But we delivered stuff house to house. Uh, milk, uh, people would leave a note. Uh, we used bottle, glass bottled milk at that time, you know. And they'd leave a note in their bottle. That, uh, want something the next day, mm -hmm. whether it be butter or chicken or eggs or whatever it was. So uh, during the uh, the school time when we were in school from from fall on, <clears throat> the older brothers would go with dad in the uh, pickup truck, and we had a running board. Of course, back in those days, most people don't know what a running board is today, but. Ned running boards, and so we would stand on the running board, and Dad knew what went where. Mm -hmm. So he'd say, you know, pint of cream to this house. We'd grab a pint of cream, run, set it on the porch or on the step, and grab the empty bottles and run back to the truck. And we went through town that way because there were no grocery stores. 
Uh, there was no place for them to go get dairy products, particularly, because we had no refrigeration. Uh, the people in town, in Fairmont, during the winter months, we had severe winters back then, the Monongahela River would freeze over and ice would get 12, 10, 12 inches deep, thick. So they would cut that ice. <clears throat> Don't remember how they cut it, I, I never did know. But they would cut the ice and then take it to a house, ice house, that was a uh, log house, and the uh, thing had mud between the logs to insulate it. And then uh, people got some, uh, we called them ice boxes, and they'd stop by the ice house and pick up a 25 pound or a 50 pound or a 100 pound of ice, put it in the ice box, and that would help them keep their food longer. <clears throat> With the dairy, we had to have ice every day because we're milking 30 to 35 cows every twice a day. And we had a big ice box in our basement where after we got the, bottle, got the milk all bottled, why we'd put it in that ice box with the ice. So we'd, we'd bring a 100 pound block of ice home with us every trip, keep the ice box filled. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, then during the school months, the older brothers had to do the delivering, but during the summer months, it was the younger brothers that got to, to deliver the stuff to the people in town. How old were you? I was, a, well, I was about three years old when Dad started the farm. And uh, when you get to about, uh, when I got about six years old, then they began assigning me certain duties. And uh, my first duty really was to get the cows in the barn. If, during the summer months, we turned them out. But during the winter months, we kept them in the barn. And <clears throat> uh, so uh, the, while I'm not in school, summer months, my first job was to get all the cows. And we had a huge, we had 40 some acres of ground for farm, and they could be anywhere on that farm. You know? mm -hmm. So we'd, we'd go up over the hill, everything in West Virginia, you're either going up or going down, but uh, they would be up on the, we had two plateaus, two levels of hills, and they would be up, some of them scattered, and we'd go around. I had a, a, a dog that uh, was a collie dog. <clears throat> His name was Rowdy, <laughs> and, and, uh, but he was a good cow dog. So I'd always take him with me, and he'd help me round the cows up, and we'd get them in a bunch and drive them into the barn. And that, uh, we had to do that in the, uh, in the evening, of course, uh, for the evening milking. And then the next morning, you got up at 4 o'clock, and he would go do it for the morning milking. So that was my first duty. Then they began assigning me cows to milk. And as a young, you know, just a small boy, uh, they would give me a real easy one to start with. But as you became more proficient and you got more grip in your hands and learned more how to do it, uh, they'd assign you extra cows. So, so they were my dad and uh, my three brothers and I, we, we would go to the barn and milk every morning, and of course, I ended up with six or seven cows that, that were my responsibility, you know. But it taught me something. It really did. It taught me something I could do and, and responsibility. Yeah. That was my job. You know? So uh, it was an interesting life, but a hard life. Yeah. Coming out of the Depression, for guys who went into the service later. There's something about that the way they were raised. So many of the veterans that I've interviewed and photographed grew up much like you on yes. the farm. Right. They've never been anywhere. Yeah. Other than to their nearby town and Yeah. If you didn't have it, 
uh, I mean, you either made it because there was no place to go buy it. You almost had to make everything that you really needed, uh, except cooking utensils and stuff like that you couldn't make. But if, if you could make it, you made it rather than, you didn't have any money anyway. Yeah. You know, I could go to town, uh, if we got, once we got all the crops in, which we're doing summer month. We raised wheat, oats, corn, potatoes, beans, whatever. And uh, once we got all the crops gathered, then you could go to town on Saturday. And uh, if you could catch a ride, that was good. But if you couldn't, you walked it. I mean, back at that time, seven miles wasn't very long. <laughs> really, it wasn't. And and we could go to town that give you usually a dime, and I could get an ice cream cone for a nickel, or I could go to a movie for a nickel, or I could go get a hot dog for a nickel. So I had to make a choice: did I want to go to the movie? Did I want a hot dog or a hamburger? <laughs> I mean, uh, 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 ice cream. Uh, yeah, ice cream. <laughs> and uh, but I. <laughs> We would have ice cream socials in mm -hmm. the country. Those that, were the best. Yeah, those were the best. You know, people would gather on a weekend and and at some place and they would make ice cream and people would bring cakes and that sort of thing. So uh, I'd usually get the hot dog, <laughs> uh, <laughs> five cents. And then when I finally got the, graduated grade school, got to go to high school, I'm still seven and a half miles out of town. High school was in town. We didn't have any out where we were. We had a great school. I went to the same school for eight years and had the same teacher for eight years. Really? Yeah. But, uh, Did you walk? Huh? Did you walk? Yes. Our house was just a little over a mile from the schoolhouse. And uh, we had individuals that lived farther than that. So as they would come along, go to school, why well, everybody would just get together and walk to school, because there was no bus service or anything I like that. I used to that. do that in second, third grade. It was about a mile, mile and a half. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that wasn't tough. Well, today it would be tough, wouldn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, it was a different, different life, and. Uh, but you didn't know because everybody was in the same boat, yeah. you know. So uh, you didn't have a, anything to compare to somebody better off. I had a couple of uncles that uh, worked eventually at Owens, Illinois, glass place where they made all kinds of bottles, glass bottles. And they were better off than we were as farmers. Uh, because they had a regular set salary that they could depend on every week. Mm -hmm. We didn't. You know, if, if we lost a, a crop of wheat because of the weather or a crop of oats, that took a hole in the, <laughs> in the yeah. budget, you know. So, but it was, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, Stayed on the farm until I was 16. Uh, I had a, my next brother up, second, second brother. <clears throat> when he became 16, he was not really thrilled about farming. Now he did his share, but uh, he would have rather been doing something else. And when he reached 16, President Roosevelt had just started the Civilian Conservation Corps. CCC. Yeah, CCCs. And wh how he got wind of it, I have no idea. But uh, the dairy thing was changing at that time also because some of the larger farms in the country were having to change to pasteurization and homogenation, and the little farmer to afford that expense that you had to go to to make that change because you had to have a bunch of equipment. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. naturally to pasteurize or to homogenize. So uh, farming milk delivery started down, and by that time we had some refrigerators. People would come up with gas refrigerators. They'd run on gas, I mean natural gas. So uh, the farming started to cut down, and uh, as a result, well, the family began getting rid of cows because you had no place to sell your milk. You know? And <clears throat> so it had reached that point, and my brother decided that uh, he would go to the CCCs. And fortunately, they sent him to a camp in West Virginia, about 60 miles from home. Mm -hmm. But uh, on weekends, occasionally, in good weather, uh, he would hitchhike home on Friday evening and uh, then hitchhike back on Sunday. And when he would come home, uh, they were paying $21 a month for the CCCs. And they furnished all your clothing and your food and your medical and all of that. So <clears throat> uh, when he would come home, he would have some dollar bills. I, I never had a dollar bill in my life, you know. So uh, I decided that that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> and uh, much to my mother's chagrin, uh, I joined the CCCs. I'm 16. And uh, <clears throat> thinking I would go to the very same camp where he was, because as far as I knew, that was the only one we had, you know. But didn't work that way. We had uh, eventually 29 CCC camps in the state of West Virginia, scattered all over the state, you know. So they sent me to Morgantown instead of where he was, a little town called Pickens near Elkins, West Virginia. And uh, I went there for a couple of months and then we had individuals there, about 260, 65 in that number, uh, from New Jersey, New York, Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and uh, they loaded all of us aboard a train and shipped us to Montana. So that's where I was. That's a long way. A long way. I, th I thought, I'll never get back home. Uh, <laughs> there's no way in the world I'll ever get back <laughs> home. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but that's where I was when Pearl Harbor was bombed okay. uh, on December 7th. And they called us out then the next morning, got us in formation. The CCCs were run by Army people. We had a commanding officer. We had a first sergeant, a mess sergeant. And we had some clerks in the office, Army clerks that did the administrative stuff. And... Uh, <clears throat> They told us that if you were over 18 years of age and you wanted to go to war, because America was going to war, because President Roosevelt had already said, we're going to war, uh, you could go directly into the Army. You could enlist right then and be a, wow. go to you know, basic for the Army. Yeah. But if, you're, uh, if you weren't 18, you had to have a parent consent. Uh, my father died when I was 11. So I knew my mother was not going to sign that paper. Was just, ain't no reason to ask, because she's not going to do it. <laughs> so uh, they put me on train, sent me back to West Virginia, and when I got home, uh, I'm still just 17, but uh, <laughs> I wanted her to sign a paper off the, so I could go in the Marine Corps. And she wouldn't do it, so I had to wait until I was 18. And in November, after I was 18 in October, I went in to enlist. Was, I didn't know that we would go overseas. I didn't know we had a Pacific Ocean, as far as that's concerned. And I, I knew nothing, I'd never heard of Guam or, or Pearl Harbor, none of that. So uh, I thought, I'm just on enlist, but I'll stay right here in, West, or in the United States yeah. to protect my country. Yeah. Well, uh, first time I tried, they turned me down because I was too short. But that, they turned a lot of individuals down in our community 
because most of the businesses, clothing business or stores, drug stores, that type thing, uh, were run by uh, Italian people. And most of them were very short, just like me, you know. And so this recruiter, because of the rules that the Marine Corps had, he couldn't accept anybody that was not 5'8 or better. So I'm not the only one he turned down. <clears throat> but when I asked him why I couldn't go, that's what he told me, you're too short. Didn't explain anything else, just too short. So uh, right after, uh, that was in November of 42, early in 43, we already began having casualties. Guadalcanal had been attacked. We had a tremendous number of casualties there, and uh, uh, Bougainville was on the schedule, and so they needed more people. Brinkle realized we're going to have to have more individuals, so they lowered the height requirements. And uh, I'm positive in my own mind that individual kept every paper he had that he had to turn down. And that gave him a good recruiting source because he came to the farm and looked me up, you know, and asked me if I still wanted to go in the Marine Corps. And I said, yeah, and that was in uh, February of 1943. But uh, they were getting so many volunteers that wanted to go in the Marine Corps that uh, <clears throat> they couldn't take them immediately. They had a waiting list. And eventually it boiled down to where they were taking two people to the Marine Corps from each county in the state. And Paris Island uh, was overwhelmed with people. They uh, didn't have enough drill instructors. Who anticipated they would have that many people so drill instructors weren't trained, you know? They didn't have a reserve anywhere. And, and they didn't have housing to take care of them. So uh, they began establishing what they called troop trains that started in the south, Florida, Georgia, down in there someplace, and they would come up through every state and they would pick up so many people going to the Marine Corps. In West Virginia, six of us, they agreed that six of us could go to the Marine Corps. All the rest of them that were in that uh, center that day, they had to go Navy or Army because the Marine Corps was only going to take six from that group. And why, did, why did you uh, pick the Marine Corps? Well, I've been asked that question a number of times and uh, no doubt it was the uniform. I, I'm positive it was. During the Depression years, back 36, 37, along in there, I'm talking about 19, 36, 37. Uh, we had a couple <clears throat> individuals, unrelated, but a couple individuals that enlisted into the Marine Corps, and they only had one enlistment after six years. When you signed up, you went for six, you know. Okay. And they were they were granting at that time one 30-day furlough a year to come home. You didn't get home except that one 30-day furlough, and the Marine Corps had uh, issued an order that every Marine on the 30-day furlough had to wear his dress blues all the time he was home. Uh, in my own mind, I'm convinced it was an advertisement kind of a thing. Yeah. yeah. I had two brothers that were drafted, my next brother and then the brother after him. They were drafted in early 1942, right after Pearl Harbor. and. They went, one of them went to Maryland, the other one went to Ohio, and uh, they would hitchhike home occasionally on a weekend, and they had to wear their army uniform, because it took all the civilian clothes away from you, mm -hmm. you know. And <clears throat> those old brown army uniforms, they were all wool, ugly. They was just ugly, that's all there is to it. <laughs> and if you got wet, it was like <laughs> Looked even worse, huh? <laughs> they got real heavy, you know. Yeah, that wool. <laughs> That's right. That old wool would just hold the water, you know. So, uh, 
Uh, I, I just decided that the Marine Corps uniform was a whole lot more attractive. It is the best looking one. <laughs> yeah, and I had no, uh, we never, saw, hardly ever saw an active duty person at all. Uh, so it, we had no military influence around that influenced me, you know, except those two guys that come home with dress blues and I have to admit, they could pick up the girls real easy. <laughs> That's the real reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, so you went to training, and and so after training at Paris Island, I'm sure. Uh, nope, I went to San Diego. Oh. Yeah, okay. so we got on these troop trains, and they all ended up in San Diego because okay. the East Coast at that time was so much more heavily uh, populated okay. than the West Coast, yeah. and San Diego was not getting nearly the volunteer into the Marine Corps. So uh, they would pick up, they picked up a six of us in West Virginia, but in every state they'd pick up a few, and we'd get to Chicago, the train would get to Chicago, uh, the seats were very comfortable. They were these wooden seats with slats in them, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what you sat on. Uh, no cushions. The whole trip. The whole trip. Took five days from West Virginia to California. But in Chicago, you had to get off one train and then go a block or so to catch the one going west mm -hmm. because you had to change east and west trains because they didn't connect. I don't know. And uh, so I ended up in San Diego. And of course, I'm called a Hollywood Marine, naturally. <laughs> naturally. <laughs> but being, uh, when you graduated boot camp, they gave you 10 days furlough to go home. I couldn't get home and back in 10 days. Yeah. So I never got home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was a different life. I. Uh, I, I feel that we were very fortunate in my particular platoon. Most platoons had three drill instructors assigned to them. And these were active duty Marines that, you know, they'd been in for a while. And some of them had already been in combat. Some of them had already been to Guadalcanal. But anyway, when, <coughs> when we were at boot camp and... Uh, uh, Two of our three drill instructors had already been in combat, okay. and they knew what it was about. Most drill instructors had no more idea about combat than I did, you know. But that was very beneficial. That was good. Yeah. Absolutely, because you're training by people that already been there, mm -hmm. and they know what it is to be shot at and digging foxholes and laying in the mud and, and all that stuff. They already knew that. And uh, so it, it gave us an insight that we would not have had otherwise. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that f I was shipped out uh, in uh, August of 1943 for South Pacific. We landed at a place called New Caledonia first, and it was it had already been secured. It was owned by the French, and uh, it was a replacement center or uh, a place where they brought all the Marines together. Then they would funnel them out to where they were needed with other Marine divisions. Yeah. And we were there for a couple of months, and then they sent us sent this group that I was with to Guadalcanal. And so we arrived in Guadalcanal in December. Of course, it had been secured since the year before, 1942. It had already been secured. Mm -hmm. And all kinds of buildings and army bases and navy bases and marine bases and airports and all that stuff was already there. But that's where we began training uh, on the flamethrower, they hadn't had any flamethrowers up until January 44. Oh, really? 
they, they came out at that time, and nobody had ever seen one, of course, and didn't know how to use it or <laughs> anything about it. <clears throat> but, and we had to train ourselves, because there was nobody else with, with experience. So you had to learn as you went. You know. That could be dangerous. And that's right. But uh, <clears throat> we had a gunnery sergeant that was what we called an old China Marine meaning he'd been in Peking back in the mid, in the Depression years, in the 30s. He was, he was tough. Uh, but uh, he took over the actual training of this special group to train us both to operate a flamethrower and to do demolition. So we could either burn it up or blow it up, whichever. And none of us had ever had any experience in either one, either one of those. But from January 44 until June 44, we trained and set up all kinds of things to do to train ourselves. Uh, we uh, got aboard ship, had no idea where we were going. They didn't tell you anything until you got aboard ship. Then they never tell you, which, who are you going to tell? You know? <laughs> so, uh, we shipped out from, from Guadalcanal to uh, Saipan. And uh, the second Marine Division, we were a third Marine Division, second Marine Division is already on Saipan. And we set out in the ocean. We couldn't hear anything, couldn't see anything, had no communications whatsoever to tell us anything. But we were there in the event they needed more, more Marines for Saipan. And, Apparently, they decided they didn't. Of course, by that time, we'd eaten up all the chow on the ship, and, <laughs> and uh, we had to go back to another island to get resupplied. And once we did that, as soon as we got our ship resupplied, we took off again, and that's when we went to Guam, took Guam back, of uh, July of 44 and stayed then on Guam until February when we shipped out to go to Iwo Jima. Here again, we knew we didn't know where we were going, nothing. Uh, when we got out to sea, then they began telling us about Iwo and they had a board that they'd drawn a diagram on showing what it looked like in How the way of a- How long did it take? Huh? How long did it take once you left Guam to you're just kind of getting I don't, staged I, for yeah. the... It was several days, but I don't really, really remember. Okay. But I do remember Enough that... Enough time to think about it. Huh? Enough time to think about it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I remember they called us up on top deck and make us all sit down, and then they would brief us. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the briefing officer, I remember him saying that we were the reserve division to the other two divisions. At that point in time, I didn't even know we had other divisions. <laughs> so, but he said that the fourth and fifth division, was, they were going to be the people that would go in first. If we were needed, then they would call on us. But the campaign would probably last five days. And uh, that probably we would never get off ship because uh, of the number of Marines in those two divisions, that's 40,000 Marines. Yeah. And uh, with that size island, only two and a half miles wide and five miles long, nobody ever guessed that you would need more than 40,000 Marines mm. to take the thing, you know. So we set out in the ocean, and uh, occasionally we'd see a plane go over, but we couldn't hear anything, couldn't see anything. Uh, once in a while we'd hear an explosion, didn't know what it was. I've always thought it was a 20 inch guns, you know, from battle wagons, or 16 inch guns. 16 inch guns on the battle wagons, but I have no idea, but once in a while you'd hear an explosion. And uh, after the first day, when uh, the Marines ashore uh, lost so many, they told us the night of the first day, you're going in. They're going to need us. So <clears throat> we boarded the ship the next morning before dawn, before 
daylight and I got aboard Higgins' boats, went out and started running around in circles waiting for the signal to go ashore. Never did get it because the Marines ashore didn't have enough room on the beach to let us come in. They, they had been pinned to the beach all that time. And uh, so we went back aboard ship again. Stayed, yeah, stayed another night. Went through the same thing the next morning, back out at the dawn and off we go. And uh, a little before noon that day, the Marines had broken through the Japanese defense and uh, had gotten to Mount Suribachi. Uh, so that gave us room to uh, have room on the beach to come in. So we got in on the, actually the second day. Uh, <clears throat> third day. There's Jerry again. <laughs> yeah, Jerry. Hey, I'm sorry, I dialed the wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, I've heard I've heard of those butt dials. <laughs> yeah, okay, see you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <sighs> so how how was uh, was there any resistance coming on the beach on that day when you finally got in, or uh, was it pretty much taken care of? Yeah, there were some mortar uh, mortar rounds, some artillery, but rifle uh, individual rifle uh, encounters, no, because they'd been able to push the Japanese back far okay. enough. Uh, past the first airfield, mm -hmm. and uh, that we were out of range of rifle range. Now the people right along the bottom of Mount Mount Sarabachi, they were in rifle range, but where we were, uh, we didn't, we weren't getting any rifle range. Well, artillery is bad enough. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the the airfield, uh, of course. They had bombed it to where it had shell craters in it, mm -hmm. so you, know, you couldn't use the thing, of course, that, that was their purpose. But uh, that was the only cover that you had crossing an airfield, and it, it was quite wide. And uh, you'd just jump up and uh, run and run to the next crater, try to find a hole to get in, you know. Uh, now, that was within rifle range. The, uh, the airfield itself was, you know. So we lost a lot of Marines just getting across the first airfield. And when we got across, that's where they, where they had built, uh, where the general had built, or had constructed, a great number of reinforced concrete pillboxes to protect the airfield. Well, uh, so the, that's where I got involved with the pillboxes, and because uh, they were they were just annihilating us every time we would jump up and try to move forward, uh, we had no protection, and they were in what we call bunkers today, but pillboxes in my day, with a opening just a slot in the front of the pillbox. Yeah, Rest was it uh, mainly? For machine gunners, or both rifle and machine gun. Yeah, they could stick a, a 30 caliber Nambu they had, which is like our 30 caliber machine gun. Uh, they could stick it out that aperture, which was about eight inches wide, and clear across the front of the pillbox. So they had a complete field of fire out here. And, and, and all more we had one, right? Huh? More than one machine gun in a box? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. They could have one or as many as right. that thing would hold, you know. Yeah. And uh, our only target was that slot that we had to shoot at, you know. So uh, finally we made several attempts and then had to back off. And finally the commanding officer, my commanding officer, uh, called us offline uh, because we'd lost so many. Uh, to 
reorganize, if you will, and decide now what do we do? And uh, I had six Marines with, with uh, the company that I was an officer, they called me sergeant in charge. I was a corporal, but I was sergeant in charge of uh, this six man, six Marine group, uh, demolition flamethrower operators. And I had placed two of them with each A, B, and C companies. Now the riflemen, unless they are needed at, for a specific project or mission with a flamethrower or demolition, otherwise they're just plain marine riflemen. <clears throat> so uh, uh, during the period of of uh, twenty, well, we got there on the twenty first, the twenty second. Now we're up to the twenty third. Uh, in that period of time, those guys were gone. Uh, never did know whether they were wounded or killed. Uh, that's information that just never came back, and I never attempted to try to find out. Uh, I guess I could if I wanted to, had their information, but uh, anyway, by the uh, 23rd, the evening of the 23rd, uh, by the morning of the 23rd, I, I don't have any of those guys left to serve as a flamethrower operator. And that's when the commanding officer called on me as being the only trained flamethrower operator in the company. I was the last one. And of course, I stayed in headquarters company to uh, take care of if they needed a flamethrower or demolition, mm -hmm. it was my job to get it to them. Yeah. Hello, Dayton. Hello, Dayton. Are you busy? <laughs> Yeah, let me call you back later. Okay, cool deal. <laughs> Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye. A retired master sergeant from the Marine Corps. <laughs> he, he's the guy that owns the slingshot that I drive. He was what? He's the guy that owns the slingshot that I drive. Oh. You know what a slingshot is? No. Well, let's leave here. You got any more you want to know? Any other questions you want to answer to? Yeah, you can continue on with this, what you were telling me. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> uh, the uh, commanding officer called for a meeting of the NCOs. He didn't have many left, and he only had two officers left. Because they'd either been wounded or killed. And uh, <clears throat> I, even though I was a corporal, I was acting sergeant. That's why they called me sergeant in charge of this little unit. And, and uh, I wasn't going to go to that meeting because I, didn't, I was not qualified as an NCO. You had to be sergeant or better to be an NCO. And, and uh, I wasn't going to go, but my first sergeant told me that he wanted me there. Okay, so I joined the group. We, there weren't many of us. We gathered in a shell crater, huge shell crater that uh, probably a bomb had erupted, <clears throat> and so that we, we could get down below grazing fire level, you know, and uh, out of sight. And uh, he began trying to figure out what what we were going to do. Cause, as I said, we'd made many attacks toward the pillboxes, and that wasn't working because we were just losing Marines. Didn't have any cover. So he asked me if I thought I could do something with a flamethrower. Well, of course, he knew I was that was it, you know. And uh, <clears throat> I have no idea what I said. Some of the Marines, after we got back to Guam, after Iwo, uh, my remark was, "I'll try." Uh, whether I said that or not, I have no idea. 
Uh, I have no idea what my response was to him. But uh, he told me, get four Marines to assist me. And uh, two, two of those Marines uh, that I used had been members of a squad that I was in before I became the special units guy. And the other two, I had no idea who they were. We were so disorganized at that time, it didn't make any difference who, what outfit you belong to. You was just a Marine, period. And I picked two other guys and uh, put them in a position so whatever pillbox I'm going to work toward, they are to shoot at that aperture to try to keep them from being able to shoot at me. Yeah. And... Uh, one of the uh, other guys in the squad that I'd been in, uh, I selected him uh, as a pole charge man. The object was, or the mission was, that once you burned a cave, put flame in a cave, or put flame in a pillbox, the pole charge man had a uh, pole about eight foot long with uh, eight blocks of composition C2 fastened to the end of it. Mm -hmm. And they would run in and put that in, set it off to seal the cave or put it in a pillbox to make sure that everybody in there is gone. You know? yeah. So we called him the pole charge man. What other title could you give him? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I picked him, uh, one of the guys in the squad, to go with me. Uh, we didn't even get to the first pillbox until he got hit straight on with a with a bullet that penetrated the helmet, but did not penetrate the liner inside, and it was coming in at an angle, so it hit him. And of course, the gunnery sergeant we had, the China Marine, if he ever caught you without your strap, helmet strap fastened, you were in very serious trouble. So he said, the only thing you wear that thing for is to protect yourself. And if you don't have it strapped on, the minute you hit the deck, you're going to lose it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just going to fly off. You know? So you better not let him catch you without that strap fastened. And uh, so this guy's name was Slagger, and he had it fastened. But when he got hit, we had just crawled out of a shell crater to try to work toward a pillbox. It threw him back in that shell crater. I thought he was gone. Uh, I went back, I crawled back into the cell crater, but he was breathing and he, huh? he was out of it, but he was breathing anyway. So I went on, just left him there. I can't do anything for him. You know? And I began working toward pillboxes and uh, one of the things that has always bothered me I still don't have the answer. I've talked to psychologists and they don't have, they don't have the answer either. Uh, some of them have made some suggestions, but uh, I can't remember how I got the other five flamethrowers. They were back in company supply, which was several hundred, several yards back, because you didn't take, you didn't put the company up on the front line. You kept it to the rear because that's where your officers, yeah. that's where your first sergeant was, and that's where your uh, armor was, and people to take care of those things that they had to take care of. Uh, How far were you from the first pillbox? I have uh, distance doesn't have has no had no meaning at all, no, because you crawl more than you walk, so. You, it, you make no effort to remember that stuff. Well, you know, I didn't. You're too busy doing your job. That's right, yeah. And the psychologist that the last one I talked to said that, you know, if you convince yourself you don't want to remember something, you won't. And if you convince yourself that you do want to remember something and continue to think about it, you will remember it. So. That's the best answer I've ever had. So I had no reason to remember how many pill or how many flamethrowers I I used. It wasn't important. Mm -hmm. If if one ran out of fuel or 
was the inoperative, then get another one. It doesn't make any difference. How many, you know, so I have no idea. The report that uh, the company commander and others wrote up was that I used six of them. But I can't even swear to that. I don't know. Because I wasn't trying to keep track. But two of those Marines uh, sacrificed their life that day, uh, protecting mine. And I didn't know that until years after Iwo Jima. And we had no idea who they were. And about three years ago, a couple individuals who are computer whizzes and uh, have the knowledge and wherewithal to do record searching in the military, uh, finally found out that on that particular morning, in that particular location, two Marines were killed. So through that record and assumption, uh, we decided those had to be the two Marines. And uh, so we found that out just about the time they were commissioning. Uh, not commissioning, but designating the ship that has my name on it in California. And uh, so we had a ceremony on base that they had gone to San Diego for training. And uh, we had a ceremony there, planted a tree in their honor and got a marker to show their names and dates that they sacrificed their life. For. Did they have family attend that? No. No, no, just, uh, eventually I visited one uh, of their homes uh, in New York, outside New York City, uh, and there were two cousins that were able to, that I was able to meet with, but the rest of them were all gone. Okay. So, life has been full. I've been very blessed in so many ways. Miracles have happened in my life that would have never happened had I never received the Medal of Honor. So, that's it. <laughs> what, what do you think, what do you attribute that to? Or to you know, the things that have happened from that point until now? Divine intervention. Uh, I firmly believe that everybody, every person has a purpose in life. Whether that's right or not, I don't know. I'm just a country boy. But I think we were put here for a reason. And some purpose. And I feel that Maybe I am fulfilling that purpose. Because as a country boy from West Virginia, never having heard of the Medal of Honor, didn't even know such a thing existed. And then to have it presented by the President of the United States is just something that there's nobody in the world could arrange that. You can't make a plan for it. So it has got to be divine intervention. And I think reaching the age that I've, re that I've reached, none of my family on either side of the family, none, nobody has ever come even close to being 98 years old. My mother lived to be 85 and she was the oldest. Most of them gone long before that, you know. So uh, there's got to be a purpose. 